Bonsoir. How are you, dear friends? We are building the most inspiring and phenomenal communities of wine lovers. As we all know, wine is the catalyst of the greatest discussion. We'll be talking wine, but of course food, and everything that touches all our nation and senses. Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends. Welcome to JCB Live. This is another incredible and historical happy hour with one of the most charismatic, charming, sensual, beautiful, and irresistibly talented Heidi Barrett. She's known by Robert Parker as the first lady of wine. So this is giving me shivers and so much excitement to be able to be with her on a great conversation for the next half an hour. Heidi has an incredible past. As you all know, born and raised in the heart of Napa Valley, a great father making wine, a wonderful Napa Valley history, an incredible sister making the best chocolates in Napa Valley as well, and an incredible winemaker. She studied at UC Davis, was the assistant to the professor Anne Nobles, that you probably all know for the wheels of wine or the wheels of aroma, that very famous way of you know, analyzing, representing, and ideating wine. She's made some of the most amazing wine in the history of Napa Valley, consulted not only from Franciscan to Silver Oak to her own wonderful Amuse Bouche and La Sirene and many others, but is very well known for her contribution to Screaming Eagle. So she paints. She's an artist, and beyond everything else, she pilots from vineyard to vineyard her own helicopter. She was featured in many movies as well, and one of them she participated in on the set is the famous Bottle Shock, because her husband owned Chateau Montelina, and they both really made this wine so incredible that they won the judgment of Paris. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, let's welcome the beautiful Heidi. So Heidi, wonderful to see you. Cheers. Hello, cheers to you. I don't have bubbles, but uh, hello and thank you for having me. Well, I'm going to drink them very fast so we can enjoy your wine. Okay. But okay. here's a toast to you because this sparkling wine from Napa Valley is called Foreverness and ah, it symbolizes beautiful. you. Lovely, thank you so much. So Heidi, as you heard in this magnificent introduction of yours. How does it feel to be named the first lady of wine of America? Ooh, love, right? Mr. Robert Parker, it's all true. Uh, thank you. No, so, so sweet, really very complimentary and I, I appreciate that. So I always say I'm just trying to live up to my potential. So I, I really appreciate the compliment. <laughs> so how do you know where your potential is? You never know, you have to keep reaching. So I still haven't reached it yet, right? I'm still growing, still learning, still doing new things. So it's, it's fun, life is great. So Heidi, how has it been to be raised in the Napa Valley and parents deep into the world of wine, a father, very charismatic yeah. winemaker? Give us a little exactly. idea of this amazing upbringing you had. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I've been pretty lucky. You know, I sometimes wonder if I would have had different parents if I ever would have found the wine business. Maybe not. So I feel pretty fortunate to have had a, a very successful winemaking dad and a really wonderful artistic mother. And we moved to the Napa Valley when I was a kid. So in the late 60s. Um, and the valley was quite different then. It was very rural. It still retained a lot of the country charm and vineyards will be here hopefully forever. But when, when we were kids, my sister and I used to, you know, ride our horses across the valley. We used to swim them in the Napa River, and we would ride our horses when it was the time to take them to the vet. So we didn't have a, a horse trailer, so there weren't fences between the vineyard properties, and we would just go off and, and ride our horses down to get their annual shots and their checkup, and then we'd ride them home and pick blackberries along the way, and it was just a wonderful way to, to grow up really really beautiful back in back in those days very remote and very friendly and very safe and it's retained much of that same charm now which is great yeah for sure so yeah. what what do you learn the most as a young child being so close to mother nature 
What, what do you think that great education brought you? Well, I love the seasonal aspect of, of really growing something from the earth and taking that and making that into an elevated product. I think that's one of the things that really still excites me about wine. And I really saw that when I got to visit the winery where my dad, different wineries were, where my dad was working. And we just thought it was like visiting Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. There was this magic element about it, turning something like alchemy happening from something that you took from the earth. And I think kids always love automation, like seeing something go down a production line, like on the bottling line. Kids love machinery and mechanics to see how things like that work. And my sister and I just, we thought it was the most magic, wonderful place to visit a winery. So, so some early memories I have were, um, you know, going out early on frost protection for my dad. So understanding that, yes, it's farming, things can can go well or not. It's, it's uh, you know, a bit of a gift when we get beautiful grapes each year. And that, that's never lost on me. I'm, I always appreciate that. That's amazing. So when did you know, Heidi, you were going to make wine? Because your sister, who we love, yeah. makes some of the best food and incredible chocolate. She does. Yeah, I, she, I have that little chef sister. She's, she's fantastic. So, you know, we eat and drink pretty well at my house. If she cooks and I make the wine, it's, it's a pretty good combination. So yeah, really not till I'd say senior year of high school back then, we didn't really apply several years ahead for college. And I, you know, senior year had to pick a, pick a college or a university. I only applied at UC Davis. And I thought, well, I love, I love, um, I love agriculture. I love science. I'm, I'm good at that. And I like the combination. I like the artistic side of it, which kind of came in from my mom's side of the family. Um, so I thought, I'm just going to try this. I had already been working as a summer job, you know, as a kid all through high school doing, you know, vine sorting, suckering in the vineyard, some lab work and things like that. Um, so I just, I went straight to UC Davis right into the winemaking department and never really looked back. I didn't really have a backup plan. <laughs> well, and, and thank God you never because you gave so much to the wine world. Now thank you. you should, as we talking, we need your glass to be full. With this oh, we do. Yes, indeed. Wine. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> I fell in love with this wine many years ago, you know, tasting in San Francisco when we were side by side. And I'm sure yeah. you remember it was in Fort Mason. And I drank I half a bottle of it. And you finally <laughs> gave me the end and we exchanged wine. And I do fun. remember that. Fantastic. So we have it here. So do you want to give us a few words on it? Because this Would is... Would it be this fancy blue bottle? That's the fancy new bottle. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah, so that is our kind of proprietary Muscat uh, Canelli, which we've named Muscato Azul. So Azul meaning blue, uh, reflected in the beautiful blue bottle and reflection of uh, my love of the ocean. La Serena, of course, means the mermaid in Spanish and Italian. And it's similar in French, right? La Serene or something la like that? Exactly. La Serene, yeah, La Serene, similar. So the... Um, the draw of the ocean and the magic element of that was a good personal symbol for me to name the winery uh, La Serena. But in this case, this wine is made from Muscat Canelli, made as a dry style wine instead of as a dessert wine. So you get all the beautiful, floral, perfumey, gorgeous uh, varietal character in the aroma and the flavor of Muscat, but without the sweetness. So it's kind of a surprise aha wine for a lot of people where they give it a sniff and they think, hmm, I don't know, I think this might be sweet. But no, no, just trust me on this. And they sip. And you can see the wheels turning that their brain is a little fooled because they expect it to be sweet. And it's just a delicious white wine. Very crisp acidity, clean, pure flavors. Lovely for this time of year, really, for, you know, sipping by the pool or even we, we drink this a lot while we're cooking dinner. Um, but pairs with an amazing array of food, some of the hard to pair things too, like um, chilled asparagus. It's a great uh, pairing with that. Uh, oysters, of course. Um, even blue cheese, shockingly, can be very hard on wine, is beautiful with dry muscat. Um, yeah, the Italians do the, the, the chilled asparagus in the, in the asparagus yeah. season with dry muscat, and they, they're known for that. So kind of a fun wine. Also can go with spicy foods too. Can hold up very well to the spicy. Can, spicy foods and Pacific Rim type flavors, those tropical flavors. And you know, I had it recently with uh, oh. French cantaloupe from oh. 
Orange area, you know, that very famous Cavaillon. Yes. Orange cantaloupe with a oh, little wow. uh, uh, San Daniele ham. Oh, I bet that Typical. was gorgeous. Amazing with it. So I really commend you for Fantastic. that. Fantastic. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm glad. I'll have to add that one to the list, a new one to try. Maybe you come to the house and we have it together. Okay, it's a deal. I would love to. Well, before we go to my next question, a beautiful blue, I understand Heidi, you're an amazing scuba diver as well. Oh, I do love diving. Yes, that is one of my one of my passions is diving. And if I didn't make wine, I was sort of destined to become a marine biologist. All of those aptitude tests that they make you take in high school, everything pointed me towards marine biology, oceanography. I just love that. And then in college, I actually became a scuba diver. So I've been diving for, gosh, over 40 years probably. I've been diving all around the world. And I just do it as a hobby now. I really enjoy it. We do a lot of our vacations or diving. I am one of those fish nerds that come up from a dive and look in the books and try to find out what we just saw. And I'm fascinated by all the fish relationships. And it's so beautiful. One of the most gorgeous parts of the planet is underwater that so few people get to see. And it's magnificent. So we discover the little Heidi the mermaid in here. That's right. That's you know, actually my profile. A, a, a figurine of yourself floating in the glass. So that could be the <laughs> discovery gift. A mini hive floating in the mosquito. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a big seller. <laughs> Actually, this is sort of a little fun, um, little trivia fact. So, you know, the Opus One label that has Baron Philippe profile one way and Robert Mondavi the other way. So it's actually my profile on this mermaid. I did the same thing, put my head on the front of her. So I said, everything from the neck up is me. The rest, <laughs> use your imagination. <laughs> well, we, we love it all. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So Heidi, you are actually a lady of all the elements, from the ocean yes. to the sky. So That's we right. can see behind you, your daily routine is to visit your yes. vineyards on your helicopter. That's right. My, my, my vineyard vehicle. So I do use flying for, um, for my job. I kind of always had wanted to become a helicopter pilot. My dad was a pilot when I was a kid. Um, and I just always was fascinated by helicopters because I got to ride in them a few times when I was young. And I'll never forget that feeling of it being like a magic carpet. It's just that wonderful floating feeling that you don't really get any other way. And so I kind of waited till later in life, till my kids were grown up. When my youngest daughter went off to college, I literally took my first flying lesson that first week in a helicopter. And I wasn't a fixed wing pilot already. I just went straight to helicopter school. And uh, from going back to maybe 30 years ago, I was working for Bueller Vineyards up in the foothills or, or over in the hills of um, St. Helena in the 80s, early 80s. And I used to see a helicopter go by most days. And I said, what's the deal on, on that? And I heard it was a guy commuting to work in San Francisco. And it was sort of the light bulb going on, like, gosh, you could actually fly to work? Really? How cool is that? I want to do that someday. And it took me about 30 years to be able to do it. But I did. The week after I passed my check ride and got my license, I rented the same little trainer, the little R22 that I had flown. And I flew myself to Kenzo Estate and landed. And, uh, you know, it was just one of my, one of my best days was I, one of those lifetime dreams that I actually, that I did. I flew myself to work in a helicopter. This is so cool. <laughs> I was with some friends over the weekend who were telling me in the old days, uh, from where they live, they used to go to, um, um, you know, San Francisco. They used to yeah. land on a few hotels right up there, go to a party yes. and go back to their home. And it was the good old days. I don't, I think it's Pretty getting amazing. more difficult. Yeah, they don't let you land on buildings anymore, but I always wanted to do that. I think that looks so cool. And you still see those helipads when you pass cities that, you know, it's an option. I think maybe only for emergency use or something like that now. But, you know, these days I will, you know, next week probably start going out grape sampling that way. And I can fly to remote vineyard sites up in the mountains. I land, I can just land in the dirt or on the road or whatever and then sample, go check grapes, hop back in, fly to the next location, do the same thing. So I can cover a lot of territory pretty quickly and it saves me so much time and, and it's a lot of fun as well. So oh, it's, it's been a great addition to my business with some remote clients and some remote vineyards that I work with to go up and just fly and check out the grapes. 
<laughs> it might be a little dangerous if you come to dinner to the house on Wapo Hill. Uh, because <laughs> yeah. it's not flying in, flying out after all the beautiful serene wines we're going to have. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's kind of a hard rule. There's definitely zero alcohol when you fly. So uh, yeah, I can't mix the two. And also I don't fly at night because imagine this valley in the dark trying to find your way to some remote little location in a canyon. It's just a bad idea. So I don't really fly at night and I don't fly when I'm drinking. So we'll take a rain check on that. I'd love to come and, and have some delicious wines with you at your property, but I won't fly to get there. <laughs> That's fine. Well, yeah. you know, so I hope all the ladies listening are realizing that they are in the presence of superwoman or wonder woman. Oh, yeah. She goes from the ocean to the sky. She goes on earth to make wine. And on that note, in fact, yeah. so, uh, Heidi, you have two sides of your brain. You know, that yes. creative and scientific as well. So yes. how do you discover um, you know, that unique aspect of having those two skills and, and how do, do you put it to work? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think that, you know, winemaking is more left brain for the most part, which is all the scientific side and how does it work and, and understanding biochemistry and microbiology and we're working with yeast and, you know, and also agriculture. But then the creative side is really the right brain side where you get to figure out what's going to be delicious and and create a beautiful blend. Um, and I know that you've got a couple of wines that are that are blends, as do I. And that's really where it's the creativity on the right brain side of the winemaker where that kicks in. But based on science, based on the left brain side of, you know, mechanics and getting things harvested on time and getting wine, the grapes processed into the tanks, all of those things. But then it, there's the crossover, more the romance side, I think, comes in with blending, where you really have a chance to elevate the wine. You know that it's the magical part. Um, and also to create something delicious that, that helps elevate people's lives. It's really fun. Well, as we're talking white wine, look at this spectacular Chardonnay, Heidi. We're very okay. successful by the glass at the Oakville Grocery. Oh, and I'm so glad. Thank you. And maybe before we move to your spectacular red wine, tell us a little bit about this great Chardonnay. So the Chardonnay is something that I don't get to make very often, not many of my clients. I make wine for eight different um, wine brands, and only until I started making it for my own, I had only one other client that I got to make Chardonnay for. I love to make any wine, really. I can make anything. I feel like I just don't get to very often, depending what the, what the winery has or what they grow. So I came upon some, an opportunity to get some really special grapes from over Russian River area. And they are from the original Ruid clone of Chardonnay, the R-U-E-D. It's a little more muscatty uh, for, for Chardonnay. I love that, that flavor and that character. But these vines were planted in 1969. Um, so it's kind of the mother block of that clone over in um, Russian River, so Sonoma County. And the grapes became available and just a few tons were available and they asked if I wanted some and of, of course I did. I saw these vines. They're just like uh, people. They're, they're sort of like uh, characters. They're so big and brawny and gnarly, big, you know, big vines with, you know, muscly arms as the, as the, uh, the cordons grow. But it's quite beautiful to go out there. Some of them oh, have moss growing on them. They're so old. Yes, exactly. So like those? Like you know, those, just exactly like that. <laughs> well, whatever is born in 1969, you know, which was my vintage. Yes, I know this is your so favorite much. year. <laughs> you so have a lot in common. A lot in common. Very so, good. I love that Chardonnay and, and obviously Thank you. congratulations for that beautiful creation. Thank now, you. one of the wines I love the most, of course, yeah. is the one I'm going to pour now. Oh, the Cabernet, great. Yes, so Heidi, maybe you want to mention for whom you consult with because you've crafted some of the best wines ever in the history of Napa Valley. Screaming Thank you. Eagle is one, of course, that everybody knows. But yeah. that was the others. Yeah, so over the years, I've had a number of, of clients. Screaming Eagle, I was their original winemaker for the first 14 years until uh, the winery was sold. It's been sold about maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, so I I, they're not currently a client, but I really enjoyed getting that brand launched. I used to make wine for Della Valley as well for about eight years in the early days when Gustav Della Valley was 
was the owner there and I really got to help him create his dream and, and put them on the map a bit. So that was also a delight. Um, I used to work for Grace family, Jones family, the show cuts, uh, you know, lots of past clients, but my current, my current lineup is also pretty exciting. Um, I make wine for uh, Fantesca Estate on Spring Mountain. Yes. Paradigm, I've been with them since 1991, so I'm still their original winemaker after all this time. Yeah, a long time. Also, the Lamborn family is another longtime client, a wonderful family. I've been their winemaker since 1997, so a couple of these I've had for years. That's amazing. Um, yeah, Kenzo, I've been with them since the beginning as well, probably about 15 years now up on Monticello Road. Um, then I have some partnership brands, uh, Amuse Bouche, Osome. Uh, Van Perdu and Preto Bar, those four labels are partnership brands where I'm the winemaking partner and then we have a marketing partner. And then my own La Serena, I count that as a, as a client actually. And then a brand that's called Barrett and Barrett that I make with my husband, Bo. So we have a collaboration on a delicious uh, Cabernet that we grow on a, on a property not too far from our house over at the Barrett and Barrett property. Well, that's very impressive, Heidi. Congratulations. So two things I think we need to ask you. One, okay. naturally to describe this beautiful wine, but as well to explain us how is it to be able to consult with so many fantastic wineries and to wear different hats, different style, different personalities, different brand identity. So how do you do this right. with such success? Yeah, so really I'm their winemaker. All of those that I just described, I'm their winemaker. They're mostly pretty small, so they can sort of share me as their winemaker. So different days I go to different wineries. Um, the biggest of that group is Kenzo, um, by far the biggest. It's about 25,000 cases. So wow. I have an on-site day-to-day winemaker there, and we're in close contact, and I've worked with him for many years. So um, once we got that going and it just has kept growing, we had to hire a full-time on-site winemaker to help me there. Everywhere else, I have really good assistants, too, that run the cellars for me, have great, great crews, um, and that's kind of how it works. I do some, I kind of prefer to call it an independent winemaker because I'm still their winemaker and I don't really, you know, consult for those. I'm it. I have ultimate control and say in everything from when we pick till the corks are in, that's the job of the winemaker. So that's really my main job. I do do some occasional outside palette consulting work where I would work with a winery with their winemaker, maybe behind the scenes if they want, um, you know, problem solving, troubleshooting or improving blends. Those are, those are a lot of fun for me to do uh, occasionally as well, where you just come in for a day, fix as much stuff as I can, make the wine better, and then I go on my way. So those are, it's sort of two separate two separate jobs, but my day-to-day -day stable of winemaking clients, some are custom crush, some have small estates. Um, it just depends on the day where I'm going. So it is a lot to juggle, especially during crush. So I have to go out and you know sample vineyards often in the morning, as I said. Um, sometimes if I can fly at least once a week and go do that, it helps save me time. And then in the afternoons and sometimes mornings too, I'll go hit the ground route and go taste through all my tanks every day. I have to go to all, to all the wineries and taste through. Well, the you have the helicopter, which makes it easy. <laughs> yeah, that but helps a lot. Explain us the creative process because what is fascinating, you know, we're very fortunate to own around 28 wineries today. So I feel oh. I'm kind of a director of style where I work with our winemaking team and you know, we safeguard the identity, the personality of each of the wineries and yes. the history of them. How do you function when you create something with a new client? You sit down, you go through a creative process of taste and flavor, what they look for. How does it work for you? Well, they usually, there's kind of no way I can make any two wines taste the exact same. You know, with even with my own brand, my wine yes. just flashed me right in the face. Um, I try to be consistent year, year to year within a style and within, you know, any of the given products, like even the blends, I try to be pretty similar year to year flavor wise, the blend may be different, but I'm still going to get to that end flavor profile that I want. So with that being said, they may give me the owner when I start a new place, like Ren is a good idea at Paradigm. He said, you know, I really love those old BVs from Rutherford that my dad used to make. And I love that style, very silky, medium body wines. And I'd like to make something like that. Just give me an idea of what he's shooting for. And it happens that his property 
can make something like that because it's valley floor right in the middle of part sure. of Oakville. So I can kind of give him, you know, what he wants, but also I don't really, I'm not set in stone on that. I just, my job, I view it as really optimize what's the best wine I can make from any given block of grapes. And that really helps determine what's possible. I want to maximize the potential there. So if it's a hillside vineyard, it's going to direct me a certain way. If it's valley sure. floor, it's going to direct me a certain way. If it's the left side of the valley or the right side, if it gets afternoon sun, you know, the ripening is going to change and it, I may have to orchestrate winemaking a little differently to get the best wine I can from any plot of ground. And then things like options for blending are really interesting for a winemaker. I view it as sort of the artistic side where you have yeah. more different paints on your palette, different colors to play with. So I have more blue and purple and, you know, pinks to use if I have more varieties in blends. And that's, for me, very exciting to get to make things like Petit Verdot or Malbec or Merlot to have some blending options or really good Cap Franc is really um, wonderful too as a, as a blending option. So having those different choices depending on the estate um, is, is really great and also helps distinguish the properties, um, you know, as distinct and individual as they are. So it, 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 it sort of solves itself. It just depends on what is happening at the estate, what the owners want to make, what they want their specialty to be, and then I can customize around that. So they're all very distinct. What a fabulous, fun, creative life. Yeah, it is. So describe us this wine because I believe you are as well engaging your lovely daughters or children at large to make this wine as well. So give us a little bit of the objective of the Mermaid Cabernet okay. and, and how you work together as a family, mother okay. daughters. Okay, very good. Yeah. So the Cabernet is really our flagship wine for La Serena, and it's really probably what I'm best known for because of the wines that I made for some of the more famous brands like Screaming Eagle, Dalla Valley, and Grace Family. Those Cabernets were really, especially during the 90s, they were part of the cult wine craze of that time. And out of the top 10, I probably had three or four of them were wines that I made. So I got a lot of attention for making those wines. Thank you. Well, yeah, it, so <laughs> I know it really kind of cover of the wine the whole... news magazine, which I still have. Cover oh. of my news magazine, you know. Oh yes, that's true. Thank you. A little cover girl action as well. Once in a while, the romantic side of the business when you're wearing your rubber boots and you know up to your armpits and grapes, you have to remember there is a, a side where we actually get to get dressed up once in a while. It's pretty funny. <laughs> But the, um, the Cabernet is near and dear to my heart. I love making Cabernet. I just think Cabernet is king in Napa Valley. It's what we are known for, what we can grow the best. And most of us can be very successful with that in the Napa Valley. There's a reason Napa Valley is famous for Cabernet. It grows spectacularly here. Um, and that being said, I use some blending techniques that are, are pretty fun to make the wine very complete. To me, that's a... a not just about the descriptors, but how does it strike your palate? How does it feel across the mouth? And I want that full expression of fruit from the beginning to the end. When I'm working on wine in a blend, I'll share this. It's kind of a fun little tool that I use. Um, I use a count of six, actually. So I divide the wine into yeah. the beginning palate is one, two, yeah. mid palate, three, four, and the finish is five, six. So there's a beginning and an end to each section, the beginning of the beginning, the end of the beginning, if that makes sense. I want one, two, three, four, five, six. I want it to flow across the palate like silk. No holes in there. It just should have something of interest and expression all the way through the wine to make a really complete product, right? So the Cabernet is a great example of this where uh, individual components, I talked about, I like Cabernet Franc as a blending agent, but really by itself, it's often only the one, two spot. It's a little yeah. power punch of fruit in the initial palate but then it sort of drops off a cliff. So it's not sometimes not a complete wine by itself. You need those other varieties, Cabernet, Merlot, to build the wine and stretch it out to fill in three, four, five, six. That's Merlot right. can be fat in the middle, like three, four, five, luxurious, voluptuous, silky soft wine, maybe doesn't have the best length, doesn't have some oomph in the back, but Cabernet will, it'll carry that. So I can very strategically build a wine plug into all of these little slots so you get that complete expression Ooh. that I hope you're experiencing right now 
I'm one, told. two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, and it's just this delicious, beautiful creation that if you think about it that way, it's how I view it. It helps me make wine that are that wines that are very complete and delicious all the way across all the palate. Through. Yeah. And it's very interesting, you know, I, I had the pleasure in Burgundy to, to learn with the best, uh, most amazing inspiration I that bet. you have with that noble. And oh, yes. And a little question for you on that. Yes. And I stopped at five. I do one, oh. two, three, four, five. But now you just gave me the idea that I need to prolong this beginning. Extend the flavor, especially with Cabernet. You want that length where several minutes after you can still taste it. It still lingers and goes on. It's still part of the enjoyment. So you can kind of stretch out the, the enjoyment. The only thing not in the number count is the aroma. That's separate. I don't add that to the count. I want that to be also beautiful and enhancement, enhanced and pure. Purity of flavor and aromas are good. You don't want anything off-putting there. It just should be very true to type. It should express the variety that it's claiming to be. Um, and beyond that, if you can make it layered and more interesting and complex, of course, it's even better. Which you have achieved, obviously. Thank so you. So you, talking about aroma, the question I wanted to ask you is very opportune. At UC okay. Davis, you are the assistant to the professor at Noble. Yes. The fabulous lady who created, in fact, the aroma wheel that we That's right. Doing. So how would you describe this wine using the aroma wheel and how was it to work with Anne on this? Because I'm sure you contributed greatly to it. Oh, uh, yes, I was her little underling, you know, doing some of the tasting trials in the lab there and setting up the blind tastings. And they used to have wine glasses that were painted black, so you couldn't tell if it was a white wine or a red wine. And she liked to do duo trio tests. So you'd two would be the same and one would be different. And it was more about just blind tasting. You'd be in a little booth with your curtain, send in the samples cool. to different students. And which, which one is different? Just pick out which one is different, just to kind of test people's sensory abilities, which was interesting. And then later came actually describing flavors and what compounds can you, you know, pick up in wine and what are they similar to? And what I really found interesting, and it helps me do my winemaking notes these days too, is to be very specific about what it is. Is it berry? But what kind of berry? There's so many berries. Is it strawberry, raspberry, blueberry, blackberry? wild blackberry, loganberry, olaliberry, I mean, bear, just berries. There's so many, <laughs> you know what I mean? On the horse. Uh, yeah. The this, <laughs> or if it's pepper, the difference between a green pepper, red, orange, yellow, you can kind of, um, you can kind of test yourself and say, well, what is the flavor of an orange pepper versus a yellow pepper? If you get kind of, you know, into it and a little nerdy about flavors, you can improve your, uh, your enjoyment by getting more specific about it. And it kind of helps with, with tasting notes as well. But Cabernet, I think, is often a mix of some sort of berry, usually blackberry um, mm. in that family. Cabernet Franc will be sometimes more blueberry a little bit. Um, Zinfandel is very raspberry-like, just as an example. You can get those three. Sometimes plum, but a lot of cherry is in Cabernet, often black cherry. Sometimes red cherry, more valley floor, hillside will be more black cherry, more dark fruit driven. So, you know, flavors like that are really fun to come up with. And I don't want to confuse, you know, consumers. Sometimes we'll still get the questions, but how do you, how do you put the cherries in there? Like, well, we don't really use cherries. It's just like, it tastes like that. Or God forbid it's something other like, you know, pencil shavings or some of these other creative things that people think things smell like, like cigars or tobacco. Well, we don't actually put that in the wine, obviously, but sometimes they remind you of that. And it's simply a tool to just help you remember a wine, help you describe it and kind of uh, enhance your enjoyment of it. Just to play well, with I'm it. so excited you got to work with her on this famous Me aroma too. Wheel, Me too. Me too. You know, the international reference for all of us, you could be in France or Italy. Yes. And exactly. You know, when you were saying people think we add, we have the corridor of senses at Raymond Vineyards, which have become. Oh, that's right. You know, that's, that's very popular. And the question we have four times out of 10 how and when do you add the honey, the strawberry, the violet? I know. The leather and people actually think. <laughs> I know, and it's just confusing to people. They have to understand it's just a tool. Really, all we use is grapes. It's a simple ingredient list. You know, we are one of the few. We don't really have to put ingredients on the wine. It would be simple. It would be grapes. We just 
it's such a pure product. There's not all these other things in there. And I think that's important for people to understand. But the, your, your um, corridor, what do you call it? The corridor of? Senses. Aroma? A senses. Oh, beautiful. It helps people, you know, yeah. hone their skills and say, this is what honey smells like. When you think about it, you, you know, but unless you focus on it, you don't really absorb it. Or what is a, you know, tangerine smell like compared to an orange or a lemon? You know it, but when you focus on it, you really can settle on those flavors and it makes it really fun. You know what I'd love for us to do before I ask you a deep personal question? Uh -oh. Let's take the Rutherford estate from Raymond. Oh, yes. If you would be so kind. And why don't you, for all our guests, give it a fabulous Heidi Barrett description. Okay, I have the wine right here. You have the wine. I do. And I would be very grateful. I'm taking notes. Uh -oh, Lucky recording. That's going to be the future technical note. Stephanie, Putnam, <laughs> don't be scared. And the I know you're on. And I with Stephanie too. You've been on a trip together. Oh my gosh, I love your winemaker, Stephanie. She's just wonderful. And she's very talented as well. Her wines are very good. So we love I'm expecting, I'm expecting you know? good things. <laughs> and you know, Heidi, I'm very proud to tell you, as I've told you many times, we are so in love with the feminine touch in the winery. As a collection of wineries, we have more lady winemaker than men. I didn't and, know that. Yes, so we have today 14 ladies who are winemakers. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, between France and the US, and I, I find that feminine touch, specifically, I should say, in Cabernet, you know, uh, amazing. Because for us as European, it really allows you to have that eloquent, charismatic touch that sometimes men want it to be big and powerful and intense and rich, where ladies bring a little bit of that secondary tertiary dimension to it. Yeah, we try for, I think, well, it's a little bit individual, but I, for me, at least speaking for myself, I love, um, I love powerful wines, but I also am looking for finesse. I want elegance and I want, I want finesse. I want it to be, you know, silky and beautiful across, but also it can be sort of that idea of, you know, powerful, but a powerful fist in a velvet glove. That idea can be just, you know what I mean? Strong, but also very silky and elegant at the same time. That's quite possible. Um, this wine is beautiful. I'm really enjoying it. Cheers. Cheers. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. The first thing I get in the aroma is the sense of ripeness. I think you guys did a great job with when to pick the grapes. That's the first thing you get is beautiful, ripe fruit character in the nose. And I like the type of the type of wood treatment that you that you've used here too. It enhances the fruit, but it's not overpowering. I think that's a really key point of making delicious wine. People can get over, you know, a little excited about too much new oak, but this seems like about the right amount where you get it in both the aroma and the flavor, but it just enhances the fruit. It's just like adding a little spice. It's beautiful. I think it's pretty delicious across the palate. I definitely get that flow through of one through six. I don't think you're missing anything. Yeah, oh, it's a very, com it's a complete wine. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> I'm breathing. Stephanie. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, thank goodness. Stephanie Phew. is listening to us and I know she's breathing. She's setting little heart. Yeah. So Heidi, you've achieved so much in a short period of time in your life as a leading lady in the world of wine, an amazing charismatic talent in Napa Valley. Thank what you. inspires you? Besides what your inspires coming me? Husband, of course. <laughs> um, I'm inspired by, you know, waking up to in a beautiful place every day. We're so lucky where we live. I, I wake up happy. I'm a, I'm a positive person. So Yes. I get excited about, um, these days we're spending a lot of time at home. I'm excited about my garden. Our garden is just exploding with beautiful life and delicious food that we grow ourselves. I'm inspired about um, art. I love to paint when I have time. Um, I think when I get going on an art project, I really, I really come to life, whether it's art in wine or art in painting or creating other things. 
Um, sometimes I make jewelry. I used to do ceramics. I like the I like Ooh. the actual art side. Maybe we should make a piece of art together. That would be a lot of fun. Ah, are you, are you a painter? What what kind of well, art do you do? I do design jewelry, as you know. Oh, like fantastic! What I'm right now, Dylan. Maybe. Yes, I see that. That's fabulous. You could see closer. Oh, beautiful! The skull today. Yes, it's I love it. Multiple facets of life and personality. I love to yes. design all our places, you know, so interior design is really my passion as well, but I love to paint, not oh. in such a talented way as you do, but it is a fun. Oh. It, is a, it is a lot of fun and it, you're a very passionate person as well. So it, those are the things that give you a lot of joy in life and keep life moving forward and exciting. Um, yeah, it's, it's so the, besides, the good stuff. What else is your passion? I know it's a lot of things already, but is there something we don't know? That we want to uh, about. I love, well, I love flying. I love flying the helicopter. I love to ski and I, I missed ski season last year. So this year I'm looking forward to skiing. I really, I love to ski. I love scuba diving. I love fish. We talked about that. Um, I like, I like gardening, cooking. Um, yeah, art. I, I love all those things. I love my grandchildren. I've got two little granddaughters. They're very, very high on the list. They're so adorable and a lot of fun. So our family is uh, Im very important to me. And um, yeah, they, they also inspire me and, and, you know, to create a good future for them as well. And, and we, we mentioned about my daughters. I want to loop back to that, bringing them yeah, into the I business a little bit. The, the irresistible. And I yeah, got yeah. times. So tell There's us so much fun. Yeah, so my, I have two girls there, um, Remy and Chelsea. And Remy has been working with me with La Serena for about 10 years, actually. She's our sales and marketing director. She, yes. you know, does all of our website um, release letters and keeps all of that going as well as when we could travel some of our sales and marketing trips and, and helps me with that. Um, my younger daughter, Chelsea, is a, she does production like I do. She's a winemaker and she's a full-time winemaker at Matera right now. Mm -hmm. But we started a little, um, a little side brand, the three of us girls, um, called Aviatrix, which is a brand under the La Serena uh, umbrella. I don't have a, a bottle here, but it has my blue helicopter on the label. And mm -hmm. Aviatrix, it's a, it's a female uh, pilot from back in the World War days when the Aviatrix uh, women were really instrumental in the war effort with being pilots. And sure. yeah, and there still are a lot of us. So it's sort of a tribute to women that are, you know, gutsy and have a lot of passion and drive to do something wonderful, but it's a way for uh, me to work with my daughter. So we just started that. So Chelsea helps me make the wine for that brand and Remy does the sales and marketing of that. So it's our three-way little uh, brand startup that I've started with my daughters. This is so exciting. And Thank then you. do you want to, so this is a great project and, and I'm excited. We're going to have it, I hope very soon for sale as well at the Oakville Grocery. Yes, we do have we do have some available. Yeah, we'll we'll connect about that. I would love to have it there. For sure. Everything you do, we want to have it. Now, tell us a little bit about a secret that you've never shared, Heidi. Tell us something. And I'm gonna let you a few seconds to think about it. Okay. But I want to ask you, that gorgeous young lady in bottle shock, tell me yes. more about this amazing moment of a life you've had creating on this uh -huh. part of Chateau Mentalina, creating one of the best Cabernet and, and Chardonnay in the history of Napa Valley that put Napa Valley in 1976 on the map. Anything you want to tell us about this? Because you look so cute. On, in oh, well, okay. So here's something that a lot of people don't know is if you've seen the movie Bottle Shock, there is the, the girlfriend of Bo, who is actually a fictional character. Her name is, is Sam it? in the movie. Yes, she, she didn't exist then, and I actually didn't know Bo then um, in 1976 when the Paris tasting was happening, or actually, uh, yeah, the wine was, was the 73 Chardonnay, of course, that won the tasting in 1976, so I hadn't quite met Bo yet. But the character of Sam, they added her to, you know, make the story a little more spicy and add a little, add a little female touch. Yes. <laughs> so I did meet with, I did meet with Rachel Taylor, that actress, when she was getting ready for her role and talking about women in the wine business in those days. I was an intern. I just didn't work at Chateau Montalena then. I was working for other, other wineries, working my way up in the business. 
Um, and so I used to dress still like a woman when I went in the cellar. Yes, I'd wear rugged pants and boots and, and things, but I would still have a cute ponytail with a little bow in my hair and wear a little lipstick, you know, because for women in the cellar. So she said after we met and talked about that, she made her character a little more feminine. She was prepared to be very butch in the cellar and try to be one of the guys, but you know, you don't really need to do that. You can still be feminine and be in the cellar and still be a hard worker. So it was, Absolutely. it was fun. Yeah, it was fun working, working with her on that role. And actually, I really enjoyed working on the movie in general, even though um, that character is not me. Um, <laughs> well, you're much more attractive than she is, if I may say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Now, and then, and then, and then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I got to uh, set up the, the Paris tasting scene and teach the actors how to, you know, swirl a glass of wine. And, and it isn't an obvious um, trick for some people. So Chris Pine, the pretty famous actor now that played Bo in the movie, yes. he just had never, he just was trying to get the hang of it. So it's like, start on a table, get the wine going and then bring it up. And so He'd be doing it and pointing to me, trying to get my attention. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. It was so cute. So I really Do you had like a lot to of fun. Clockwise or counterclockwise? I go counterclockwise mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you? Well, you I, I do both because on the left side, I'm ambidextrous a little bit. So I go ah. clockwise and then I want to create the yin and the yang, the chaos. Oh. So I'm when not I, sure I can do it backwards. Backwards? No, I'm no good going backwards. Maybe I don't you think can. I can. Yes. Nope. Well, actually, pretty good. Pretty good with my left, too. <laughs> well, Because <laughs> you're like party you tricks in the Napa Valley. <laughs> if you can win an helicopter, I'm sure you could use both of your feet, both of your hands very well. <laughs> That's true. You do have to use both both hands, both, both feet, and eyes on the instruments, eyes outside. It really, it is one of these pat your stomach, you know, pat your head, rub your stomach kind of things. It takes everything you have to but do yeah. it. But yeah, yeah. So Heidi, as we're tasting the last wine. Okay. You know, and if you have a moment for this last one, we will. Yes. It's the one with the leather label, the one and a half acre. And I know you're a big believer as well of organic and biodynamic farming and being true to mother nature. I love, by the way, your father's book that he so kindly sent to Gina. To oh, really... God. Yes. Some you know, interesting believe... stories. Big stories. Amazing story. That's going to call for another time we get together on live as well, and we share it as well as you as a young lady, you know, starting the world of wine. But today we want to- That would be fun. Yeah. So, so I love your packaging. Can you tell me about this label? What is this picture on this beautiful leather label? It's just well, gorgeous. Very inspired by two major drawings in history, Leonardo da Vinci and obviously Michelangelo, two different versions of time, holding mother nature, holding the world together, and bringing the world together. In this case, we wanted to suspend the world and intertwine it between Earth, the moon, and the sun. So it's basically the interaction of the three major elements that really are the guiding principles, as you know, of biodynamic farming. This right. one, and all the estate of Raymond, today over 450 acres, fully organic and biodynamically certified. So oh. this is kind of the pinnacle of the one and a half acre that is really blend it together as a fill blend, but it's Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot. Very small production and it's applied with a leather label that is obviously the symbol of the cow that we prepare the biodynamic preparation into, as you know, the cow stomach. She has four, so we use one of them as an old Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Greek, Roman way of transporting liquids. And this is the cow stomach that is spread on this label to really represent all the elements of it. It's really fantastic. I just love the story and it's quite beautiful. It also has a nice texture for leather. It's very smooth when you feel it. It's very Thank different. You. Good for you, congratulations. Well, you do a great wine with uh, John Schwartz, Vin Perdu which we love Thank as you. a hologram label. And yes. this is a take on, on really mother nature and, and trying to have the wine feel the texture and the story of the entire spectrum of it. So that's, that's the idea. Very good. Yeah, kind of a classic, classic blend of those five too. I mean, you have the, the you know, the classic uh, 
five varieties. So that's really wonderful. As you're tasting, Heidi, two more quick questions. Is there a dream that you haven't yet accomplished, and it's going to be hard to imagine because you've done so much, that you wish to share that you're still dreaming about that you want to, you want it to take place? Well, it's more about places to go diving in the world, I would say that, yeah, and we were going, it's one of the top sites in the world. It's called Rajampat. It's part of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to go in May. It's one of those trip of a lifetime kind of places. And now the trip is postponed till next May. I'm hoping we get to go. Um, but the pictures I've seen of the exotic creatures that live in that part of the world are exciting and beautiful and interesting. And I'm really looking forward to that. And fingers crossed we get to go next year instead. But I organize a dive trip every other year for a group of fun divers of which your sweet winemaker has never missed a trip that I know of. She's been, since she joined the group, um, she's been coming every time we, we organize a trip. And so I charter a boat somewhere in the world and we just fill it up with all of our dive friends and off we go um, on these dive adventures. So this last one was, we had 18 people going, but we'll just roll it over into, into next year. It's a, yeah, a pretty big group. I pull people from all over that come that love to hang out together and dive. We also have Pirate Night. I don't know if she's ever told you about Pirate Night, but we actually, we I actually do. Yeah, we have Pirate Night. So I said, if you, if you want to join our group, you have to be prepared to bring your pirate outfit. You have to dress like a pirate and we will have you know, sort of a talent show if you can sing or dance or juggle or tell jokes or whatever. So it's, it's grown ups at play. We, you know, it's just run the boat. And I actually make a wine that's also called Pirate. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. Which is really no fun. It, yeah, it comes in this little fat little kind of like a little port bottle, but it's a, a also a blend of uh, seven red varieties. I was thinking like the treasure of the seven seas idea for a pirate wine but we've been doing pirate parties for years and it really is fun. People just kind of, you know, they just go with it and we drink and dance and, you know, have a, have a, a blast on vacation together. So, <laughs> wow. yeah, That's so there's great, other great. places I'd like to go. That's definitely on my dream list is, is, you know, fun places to go diving it's and so skiing exciting. as well. More about adventure, more about uh, adventure, adventure, you know, places to go. So maybe now the final grand finale, uh -oh. as we tasted so many great wines together, we had an amazing time. Yeah, as wonderful. Is there a, a message you want to share to everybody listening? Because everybody now is going to listen to this many times because you're an inspiration, oh. you guidance, you are such an example and you, you're such a force and you're such a talent and such a leader. Thank you. Is there a message you want to share to everybody who is with us today? Well, thank you for being so kind and complimentary. I really have enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun to sit with you and chat today and drink some delicious wines. So I really appreciate that. Um, I guess the message would be to you know, seek out wines that are delicious. And if you find a winemaker that you enjoy what they do, I think it's always great to support them and buy their wine and, and have that be a part of the joy of your life. I think it can make life better. Um, I feel so lucky to be part of it. And I appreciate every time people buy my wine, I'm so appreciative of that. So I think that's my main message is if you find wine you love, buy some. And I really appreciate that. And I really enjoyed um, sharing some time with you today and getting to taste some of your beautiful wines also. So yeah, thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Heidi. And I'm going to go back for more <laughs> La Sirene Cabernet. And I just want to leave our friends and yourself, of course, to say to everybody, Heidi is one of the most amazing examples of following your dreams, following your passion. We've heard it all today from underwater to earth to sky. She does it all from creating art to creating art in the glass, being an amazing mother, a great wife, and obviously a fabulous leader to the wine world and a force in Napa Valley and beyond. So let's not just think Napa Valley. We, we heard the Chardonnays from the Russian River as well. So Heidi, I want to thank you for being who you are. And thank you. From your parents to your fabulous sister, as you know, we love her too. 
And, um, you know, being such an amazing, colorful, phenomenal personality that we adore. So thank you so much. Cheers merci to you. So thank you so thing. much. Merci. Merci. And we'll cannot wait to be together soon. I agree. See you soon. Thank you so much.